Hello and welcome to Frame for Light. I'm Dave Kelly. This program is designed to encourage people to develop a greater sense of appreciation for both the art and the science of photography. Today we're going to talk about optics and lenses and how we utilize lenses to capture light. But before we get started on our topic for today, I'd like to do a brief recap of what we talked about in the first episode. So when we recap episode number one, we should start by talking about how light is generated. We know that light is generated by the sun and it's actually electromagnetic energy that radiates from the sun. That electromagnetic energy radiates waves of um, synchronous frequencies which travel together and form what we know as white light. And that white light exists as rays. And these rays include the various color wavelengths in the visible color spectrum. So the visible color spectrum involves uh, wavelengths that measure anywhere from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, which are very small measurements in the overall spectrum of electromagnetic energy. And that spectrum includes everything from gamma rays to X-rays to the visible spectrum of light to microwaves to um, radio waves. So it's a full spectrum and we just focus in photography on that visible spectrum of light. Now the shorter wavelengths in that visible spectrum scatter more easily than the longer wavelengths. The shorter wavelengths of course include violet and blue. The longer wavelengths include orange and red. The time of day definitely affects the quality of your photography based on the color spectrum that's available to us. For example, during midday or midday sun, we have the full range of color wavelengths. So our photography tends to look very rich and very saturated in terms of color when we photograph in the middle of the day. Then toward evening, when some of those shorter wavelengths get scattered, we end up with primarily just yellow, orange and red wavelengths so that our photography at the end of the day has that more golden, orange or reddish appearance to it. Now in terms of contrast, we know also that the angle of the sun has a great impact on the kind of contrast and shadows that we'll experience. So at midday the sun is overhead, directly overhead, so that the shadows um, are generated from straight above. And toward the end of the day as the sun gets lower in the sky, uh, the shadows get longer because the angle is lower, the shadows get longer as a result. And we also talked about backlighting last week. And backlighting involves uh, situations where the sun is behind the object that we're trying to photograph. And this can be used very creatively in photography if you know what to look for. We used examples last week of colorful flags that were backlit. And they look very beautiful and, and, um, and very nice. Also, you can do that with plants, with leaves and flowers and plants that are backlit. They tend to look very nice. Also, you can use uh, backlighting as a halo effect over the tops of buildings. And you can also use backlighting to create semi-silhouettes and full silhouettes with, again, the sun illuminating the object from behind. Well, that's the end of our recap of uh, the first episode, so now we're ready to get started on the topic for today. So let's begin by talking about optics. What is optics? Well, optics is a branch of physics where we study the uh, characteristics of light. What causes light? How does light behave? And then we also study the devices that we invent or create to manipulate light, such things as lenses and prisms and scopes and optical fibers. All of those things are developed uh, through the study of optics. Now there are two main areas of optics, and one of those is called physical optics, which is where physicists study the wave patterns or the electromagnetic wave patterns of light, and we call that wave optics. We talked a lot about that last week, and, and it involves those squiggly lines you see on the left side of the frame in that slide. And then the other kind of optics is geometric optics, which involves the study of rays and how rays travel through geometric planes. So that's called ray optics. And geometric optics treats light as a collection of rays that travel in straight lines. And as a result of that, these rays will bend and reflect or pass through a surface. 
We use lenses to bend, focus, and manipulate these light rays. And when rays hit a surface, they will either reflect or pass through that surface. Now they can only pass through if that surface happens to be transparent. Now, in this first example, we see reflected light. There's no light passing through because these are not transparent surfaces, but we see examples of reflected light in this image and three different exposure values. If you notice on the lower right part of the frame, there's a white cement basin. Above that, there's a white wall and a white mantle place. And above the mantle, you see that blue mosaic tile that has mosaic tile of blue and yellow and white and so forth. And then over on the left-hand side of the frame, we see a doorway that's an inset door, which probably has some roofing and other parts of the architecture on the left side of the frame that we're not seeing that's blocking some of the light from hitting that area. But in any event, you're noticing in this image uh, three different reflectance values. We have very bright light reflecting off of the white basin in the lower right part of the frame, and white tends to reflect an awful lot of light. You've noticed this when you've gone to the mountains and you see snow on the hillside. You have to wear your sunglasses. The light is so bright as it reflects off of white surfaces. And if you look at the mosaic, because it's darker, the mosaic tiles are not reflecting as much light as the white would be. And then when you look at the doorway, you notice that the doorway is uh, absorbing a lot of light and the reflectance value is different. But this is a good example in photography of, of how you can see three different reflectance values within one image and the camera always has to adjust to accommodate um, that diversity of reflection. Now in optics we talk about surfaces that will both reflect and pass light. So in order to do that, the surface obviously has to be transparent, such as water. In this slide, you're noticing that uh, there's reflection on the water from the sailboat. And then if you go over to closer to the shoreline, you notice where the water is very placid, the rocks and the trees are reflecting off of that water there as well. In this example of water, we see light traveling through the surface of the water and reflecting back if you look at the lower left part of the frame, you see that light blue platform where the light is coming through the water and reflecting back off of that platform. If you go over to the right hand side of the frame, you'll notice a fountain and just below that fountain there is another whale underwater that we can see because it's illuminated by light that's traveling through the surface of the water. There's an interesting aspect of this photo that I'd like to draw your attention to if you haven't been able to notice it. And that's with that whale on the left-hand side of the screen that's jumping out of the water. If you're able to see about 15 feet above the nose of that whale, there's a man in a wetsuit. He's a stunt diver who's flying through the air. And that's a stunt show they used to have at SeaWorld, but they're not doing it anymore because I think that was considered to be just a little bit too dangerous. Now in optics, we're also, when we talk about reflection, we're talking about two different kinds of reflection. And the first one is called specular, which means a hard reflection or harsh reflection. And the second one is called diffuse, which means a soft or softer kind of reflection. Now with a specular reflection, you need a hard surface, usually a flat hard surface where a lot of that light is coming right back at us. So in that case, it is a hard reflection. And with a diffuse reflection or a softer reflection, what's happening is that the surface is not flat or hard and as a result the light is, when it reflects, those rays are scattered in different directions so that the effect of it, when we see it, is much more soft. All right, so as we talk about specular reflection, we need to keep in mind the law of reflection. The law of reflection says that the angle of incidence of light uh, will equal the angle of reflection when that light hits a hard flat surface, such as a mirror. So in this example, we see light coming in at 45 degrees, and then when it bounces off of the mirror, it's going back out at 45 degrees. So again, the law of reflection says angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. Now this is an example of a plastic ball that's giving us um, a little bit of both. We see specular or hard reflection on that ball where the light is reflecting right back at us. 
So it's a plastic ball, so there's a shiny plastic surface that that light is hitting and reflecting off of. But because the ball is round, it's spherical, and it also has a bumpy surface and sort of that pebble surface on that ball, we're seeing the light that's hitting it is being uh, reflected off in different directions, and so it's diffuse in that way. So if we go to the next example, which is a navel orange, the navel orange is round and a similar color to the uh, ball that we just looked at. But this is uh, the typical orange peel that you see on a navel orange. It's got crevices and creases, and it's got a lot of dimples, and, so, and it's also round. So when the light hits it, it's bouncing off in a lot of different directions. So again, an example of diffuse reflection. And if we look at the other side of that navel orange, you see that crease in the upper left side and also some other imperfections in that peel. Uh, all of that light reflecting off of those dimples and all of those creases and so forth is diffuse because it's bouncing in different directions. All right, we've been talking about reflection a lot, but now we need to introduce a new term called refraction. So refraction means the bending of light. So in this example, we're showing a light ray coming in from the upper left, and that light ray hits what's called a surface interface. Now that surface interface in this example has to be transparent. So the interface between the air, where the light is coming in through the air, and then hits a surface interface, then it's going to go into glass or water. And so when that light goes through glass or water, that light ray has basically three choices. It can continue on in a straight line, which is what's seen by that orange dotted line or it can reflect, as we've been talking about. So we see reflectance in the lower left part of that imagery. Or it can be bent, or it can refract, uh, which means it is going to uh, go in a different angle. So you can see in the lower part of that frame, it's refracting and bending down at a different angle on the other side of that interface. OK, here's an example of water refracting, um, excuse me, light refracting when it goes into water. So we have that uh, killer whale, and the light goes through the water, and we can see the light underneath the water line illuminating that whale. So let me give you another example, which I think you can all relate to. You've all been standing in a swimming pool, perhaps standing next to a friend, and you look down into the water, and you notice that your legs look very short and very compact. It can almost be a little bit humorous when you look down in the water. And why is that? Well, it's because when the water, when the light goes through the water, when it hits that surface interface, which is the surface of the water, and goes down into the water, that light is being refracted or bent by the water. And so it creates um, an optical illusion. So your legs are not all of a sudden really short and compact. It's just that the light is being bent, and therefore it gives you a distorted view of what your legs actually look like in the water. OK, let's go to the next image. The next image is the killer whales jumping uh, together uh, simultaneously in an evening show. We know that this is evening because uh, the shadows are long and the water is dark. And so when you have situations like this, it's difficult to see refraction in the water because of the angle of the sun. So the point here is that the time of day can have a direct bearing on how much refraction you're going to be able to see in the water. OK, so let's move on to talking about lenses and why we use lenses. Well, lenses are used to bend or refract light. And that's the whole purpose of a lens, is to take light rays and refract them in a way that it will be beneficial in the recording of that light. So here's an example um, in this graphic of how a lens uh, converges light. That's why we call it a converging lens. It takes a ray, uh, you see that top ray, and you also see that bottom ray. As they go through the lens, the lens bends or refracts, or in this case, converges the light into a point of focus so that we have focused light. And that's, again, the whole point of a lens is to converge and focus the light. Otherwise, we don't have much except unfocused light. And the reason that's important is illustrated in this example of a lot of detail. So you need to have really sharply focused light in order to be able to capture an image like this. You have a lily pond. You have ripples in the water. 
um, in the foreground in the lower part of the frame. You also have leaves on the right hand side of the frame and you have a wooden post that has water dripping off of it in the middle of the frame and those water droplets are actually frozen or isolated in that freeze frame and you need a pretty fast shutter in order to be able to capture water drops in midair. And so we'll talk more about shutter speeds in a moment. But this is the reason why you need focused light, because you're shooting imagery that requires a lot of detail to be represented in your imagery. Okay, now we're going to talk about the focal length of lenses. The focal length um, is actually a measurement of how long that lens actually is. And the top lens is a 50 millimeter lens. And if you know anything about the metric system, you know that a mil millimeters, uh, it takes about 25 millimeters to equal an inch. I think it's actually about 25.4 millimeters to an inch, but let's round it off. So 50 millimeters would be a two inch long lens. So that's a two inch long lens. And the bottom lens is a 100 millimeter lens, which is about four inches long. So in the next slide, we're talking about the diagonal angle of view that we derive from these various lenses. Now the 50 millimeter lens is called a normal lens because it will give us a 45 degree angle of view. And that's considered a normal view of the world. So if our eyes were to be converted to cameras, the, ang the diagonal angle of view that we would see would most closely represent uh, the normal lens or the 50 millimeter lens or the 45 degree diagonal angle of view. Now with the 100 millimeter lens we notice that the light uh, angle of view, the diagonal angle of view is actually much more narrow and it's about 23 degrees. So the reason for this, I'm going to use my hand to demonstrate this example. My hand is now showing about 45 degrees between those fingers. So that would be your 50 millimeter lens. That's the angle of view you get with 50 millimeter lens. Now when we tighten it up to a 100 millimeter lens to get a longer view, you notice that it's compressing that imagery. So as the lens gets longer, the angle of view uh, gets much more narrow and much more compressed. So we go back out to 45 degrees with that 50 millimeter lens. And then if we want a wide angle, we have to go even wider than, than 50 millimeters. So if we put on a wide angle lens of let's say 30 millimeters or 25 millimeters, we're going to widen it out even more. So you have a very wide angle with that. So from wide angle to the 50 millimeter, 45 degree angle to the 100 millimeter angle, which is about a 23 degree angle of view. So that gives you a good idea of the differences between lenses. Longer lenses, I've just been talking about this, they compress distance and they allow you to do close-ups and close-up perspective from far away. And here's an example. There's an outcropping there in the foreground that's of interest and in order to get close to that outcropping, you've got to use a longer lens it's not possible to walk over to that outcropping, so you need to use a, long, a longer lens in order to bring it close up. There's a lot of interesting material in the background as well, and so by the positioning of this, it almost looks three-dimensional with that object in the foreground. This is in the same area. This is actually an area called the Blue Mountains in Australia, and it's blue because you have that haze in that valley in the, in the background. That haze is caused by eucalyptus trees which transpire a vapor into the air and that vapor has molecules which scatter the blue wavelengths when the light hits it. Very similar to the sky and how um, nitrogen and oxygen molecules in the atmosphere scatter the blue light waves. So in any event, it's the Blue Mountains. You see the Three Sisters peaks in the foreground and those peaks can only be approached uh, with a long lens because you can't walk over to those peaks. There's a very steep cliff where the camera is located in this case. And also this is an example of depth of field to infinity which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Depth of field is the amount of material that's actually in focus. In this shot, the foreground, the background, everything is in focus. So we have depth of field to infinity here. Now zoom lenses have been developed to combine a range of focal lengths. We need to have a range of focal lengths for convenience 
uh, because in the old days, uh, photographers used to have to carry around a whole bag full of lenses. Uh, they needed the wide angle lens, they needed the normal lens, the 50 millimeter, they needed close up lenses depending upon what situation they might find themselves in. So in order to make it easier for photographers, we developed the zoom lenses to take care of that. Now there are some problems potentially that are introduced by zoom lenses and later on in the course we may talk a little bit more about spherical aberration which is one of the problems that could potentially be introduced by a zoom lens but a more important one is actually a disease that I refer to as zoomitis. And this is a disease that affects people when they first get a zoom lens. They realize how wonderful it is that they don't have to keep moving around to get different perspectives. They can just zoom in from any location and get a close up. Well, that's not the best way to approach photography. And I hope you can avoid zoomitis. And we'll talk more about that later on. Okay, aperture and f-stops. This is really important because this is how we derive uh, the amount of light that comes into the camera. Now the aperture controls uh, the diameter of the lens opening and it functions very similar to the way that your eyes function. And let me talk about your eyes for just a moment. First of all, you either have blue eyes or brown eyes or green eyes or gray eyes. And it's one of those, but regardless of what it is, that colored part of the eye is called the iris. Now the iris has a dot in the middle, it's a black dot known as the pupil. Now it's up to the pupil to regulate the amount of light coming into the eye. And that's just the, the, exactly the same way the aperture works. And so with the pupil in your eye, if you're in a bright sunny day, that pupil will contract and get smaller and get very small because it wants to regulate the light and keep out a lot of that abundant light because it's not necessary. But when it's dark and it's nighttime and you need to see better, that pupil will expand, it will, it will dilate. And in the dilation and expansion process, it allows more light to come into your eye. If you've ever gone to a Saturday movie matinee and you've been standing out in the hot sun, as you're standing in the ticket line buying your ticket, you've noticed that uh, your eyes uh, are adjusted for the sun, the pupils are contracted, and everything is fine at that moment. Then when you walk into the theater, the theater is very dark and you can't see anything. So now you have to wait for your eyes to adjust. And when your eyes adjust, it means the pupils are dilating, they're expanding so that you can take in all of the available light and you can walk to your seat in the theater without stumbling, hopefully. So that's how the aperture works too. It regulates the light. It closes down if uh, there's an abundance of light and it opens up if there's not enough light. So the f-stop represents the focal length divided by the diameter of the opening of the aperture. So here are some examples. Uh, if you have a 100 millimeter lens and you have the opening of the aperture at 25 millimeters measured across, that's pretty wide open. So a 25 millimeter aperture with a 100 millimeter lens, so you take 100 and divide it by 25, you equal 4. So your f-stop is 4, or f4, and that would be considered wide open for that lens. Now on the other side of the coin, we have a 100 millimeter lens where the opening is only 6 and a quarter millimeters, so it's one-fourth of what it was before. So as you can see in the illustration, uh, there's just a small opening in that aperture. And the focal length in that case of 100 is divided by 6 and a quarter, and we end up with 16, or f16. So that's, that is a closed down or stop down lens. Now this affects depth of field because with a wide open f-stop like the f4 that we just talked about, you have a shallow depth of field, meaning that only the subject will be in focus and everything around it is going to go soft or out of focus. If you have a closed down f-stop, the f16, then you have wide depth of field and often depth of field to infinity. Now here's an example of a koala bear, speaking of Australia and eucalyptus leaves that we looked at at the Blue Mountains. The koala bear in the foreground is in sharp focus, but his friend on the tree next to him is out of focus. And that's appropriate because we want to highlight that koala bear in the foreground and we don't need all of that other information around him. So that's an example of of shallow depth of field. Here's another example. We have flowers in the foreground. Those pink roses on the right hand side are in focus, but the house and all the material behind it is in soft focus 
And so that's another example of shallow depth of field. As we go to the next example, we're looking at um, wide depth of field. And in this case, we have that uh, sphinx-like structure and the foreground is in focus and the building and everything behind it is also in sharp focus. So we have depth of field covering the range. We're probably using an F16 stop-down um, lens for this situation. Okay, here's the ultimate example of depth of field to infinity. This is in Venice, Italy, and we're on the waterfront walking along, and we see that the folks in the foreground are in focus. The middle part of the frame where we have all of the people, is that part is also in focus, and at the back side of the frame, you see those buildings, those are also in focus. So that's depth of field to infinity, probably again using an F16 um, f-stop in this case. Now let's talk about the shutter for a moment. The shutter regulates the length of the freeze frame and we all became shutter bugs because we like to push the shutter button. Well what the shutter does is it regulates the length of that freeze frame. So the shutter is closed all the time until you push the button and then when you push the button there's an amount of time when that shutter will allow light to go through that aperture. And it's usually a very short amount of time. So sh the shutter speed is measured in increments of one second. And so the typical speeds involve the numbers you see below. Those numbers are actually representative of a ratio, and those numbers are the denominator. So you see 1, 15, 30, 60, 125, 250, 500, and 1,000. So you put 1 as a numerator over the top of those numbers as denominators and you come up with the duration of time based on one second. So one over one means you're open, that, sh that shutter is open for a full second. If it's one over 15, it's a 15th of a second. If it's one over 30, it's a 30th of a second and so on. And so the shorter, um, the longer shutter speeds like one second, one fifteenth, one thirtieth, those um, are very um, long shutters and you'll get a lot of motion blur. If you want to avoid motion blur, you need to go to the 1,500 or 1, 1,000. Now this is an example of a shutter speed of 1, 500th or above. You're freezing the action on that water slide without motion blur. Now here's an example of a diver at uh, the show in SeaWorld. He's on fire, but in this case, he's diving into the water and there's no motion blur. So motion blur occurs when the action is faster than the shutter can accommodate. And here we're seeing um, a whale uh, uh, in the whale show and we see that there's a little bit of motion blur on the left side. And in this case, we have a highway where the camera is on a tripod and the photographer kept the shutter open for a couple of seconds here. We can't see the cars, but we see the, the streaks of light from the headlights and the red light from the tail lights. And here's the final image of motion blur. We have a bird flapping its wings faster than the shutter can accommodate. Everything else is in focus, but those wings are not. And that's our last image for today. I hope you've enjoyed this show about optics and lenses, and hopefully you can use some of these principles in your own work. Join us next time when we'll talk more about how to create depth in photography. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. I'll catch you next time.